We haven't seen a demonstration like that from literally any other humanoid robotics company. Unitree has showed some cool stuff. Figure has showed some cool stuff. Like there's a lot of cool demonstrations. There is not a single humanoid robotic demonstration that is on par with what we saw last night from Tesla. So what comes to mind is like, yeah, there, there is a 5, 10, 20 year vision that says this is what the world's going to look like. And this is what we're building towards. But what does Tesla do better than anyone else is that they know how to monetize the road there. They know how to monetize the road there. FSD is the perfect example. Even their electric vehicles are a perfect example. Because what, what, what are the electric vehicles really doing? They are building out the supply chain foundation for the next generation of energy transportation and energy generation systems. That's why the cars are there from the very beginning is to get enough demand for batteries so that the costs come down and they can start putting freaking batteries everywhere. Okay. And then to get to a self-driving future, what do you need to do? You need to get the data needed to get the cars to drive themselves. How do you do that? You slap the self-driving software in the cars you sell now, and then you don't turn it on until you are comfortable that you have everything you need. And then you literally, uh, your customer base becomes the data gathering tool and the profitability tool so that you can justify make, keep making cars and you get the data and the public benefits from the progress of that technology. To me, the bot's going to benefit from the same exact thing. It's obvious from watching that, the, the presentation, right? Um, if I go and pull up a snippet from that presentation and we look at what the bot was doing. So what, what is Tesla doing, right? Tesla is showing that this robot can do tasks, even if it's teleoperated to your point, right? Even if it's teleoperated and somebody on the other side doing something. That is clearly a useful thing to do. Pick thing up, move it. So what is a realistic way of executing this where you can start monetizing this now so you can start ramping up the supply chain needed to make millions of these per year and get the data you need to actually do those movements. You start using these in commercial applications, starting with Tesla, with a teleoperator that steps in when the robot doesn't do the movement correctly, utilizing artificial intelligence. Literally exactly what the cars are doing now. It's, and it's an exception. It's an exception based data gathering system so that the human or robot can be fully autonomous in the long term. And how do you do the exception gathering? You start using it in your, in your manufacturing process so that the person that's teleoperating, let's say that person is in charge of five robots or even 10 robots. When the robot fails and it sends a ding to the VR headset of the person or whatever, hey, there's an error. Can you uh, help me? The person going in and doing the movements they were doing with these robots, that is the exception gathering process that gets sent to the mothership AI cluster of training. They use that to make it better. And then you start deleting errors. You start deleting bugs. And then you're like, okay, so this works now in a mass manufacturing setting. We feel like we have 99.999% of the movements figured out. Let's start selling it to other auto manufacturers. Let's start selling it to uh, any manufacturing company. And then what you say is like, hey, we'll, you, know, you can buy 10 of these. And for each 10, we recommend you buy at least uh, one tracking system so that you can manage the exceptions properly. And then that teleoperator becomes a job for this, for this, for this robot in the, in the early stages. And then you keep introducing it to more and more use cases, right? And then that's how you create the automation over and over and over again. But what this means is that this right here, you, you, don't, you don't wait until it's fully autonomous to monetize it. You can, uh, you can monetize it the second you feel that the movements and your, your teleoperation is successful 99.99999% of the time. And there is a market that would benefit from this tremendously where they can cut their physical labor overhead by, by half or by 10x, whatever that number is. And then businesses care about profits first and foremost, right? How is this not going to have incredible demand even as a teleoperated uh, a thing? And the fact that they had it there walking around people, even if it's teleoperated, y'all, what that means is that they're comfortable with this thing not killing somebody. They would not have done this unless they were like, man, this thing kind of falls over sometimes. That would be a disaster. They had two people passing out just from being there. That's why it was late. Imagine the bot starts like falling on people and someone's got their kit there or whatever, or they're like, you know, a, a shorter person and this thing just falls on them and then they fall and they hit their head and God forbid something terrible happens. They, they knew the risk. They literally brought in 2,500 people, Hans, 
they brought in 2,500 people and unleashed robots everywhere. And they're like, yeah, just we're comfortable. What does that say? In a, in a manufacturing setting that's super controlled, like the, 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 the risk of something happening there is 100 times less than what they just showed at the event. Yeah, so there's the, the unit economics part is super key in the scenario that you just laid out. And I think, you know, it, it's easy to assume that we are at the, you know, one person per potentially multiple bots point, but we'll, we'll zoom out and, and step away from Tesla at this point in time. And I'll transition over to thinking about figure robotics. Um, we know from the conversation that Brett Adcock had with Herbert and with uh, Scott Walter the other day that, you know, they were talking about a lot of these exact challenges and their figure one, you know, the first version of their humanoid robot prototype, like it took tons of engineers and then operators and, and everything just to get it to kind of do a task every now and then. And so you're talking about like the the people that work on the actuators who are highly paid and, you know, all like all these people to make this super complicated machine. But that's because the first one, you know, they're just trying to figure out how to make it and they haven't figured out how to make it reliable and scalable and manufacturable. And so, you know, it's the the version of the Waymo where, you know, there's a, an engineer who gets paid $150,000 a year who's sitting in the driver's seat, like, except times multiples of that for your first one. Then once you go and you fix that one and you do your design revisions and you figure out how to make it way more reliable um, and robust, well, then maybe you can get it down to the point where you've got a team of two or three humans per robot. And then like the next one, maybe it's one human per robot. And then maybe, you know, at some point in the future, you can have multiple robots, tens of robots, a hundred robots at some point deep into the future and one human kind of supervisor. And that's the path that, you know, Tesla is also on. I don't know, you know, where along that spectrum they are today, because, I mean, one of the things that was obvious from the watching the the interaction because of specifically the safety point that you were picking out, that each Optimus robot had at least one, and I, it looked to me in most cases multiple Tesla employees that were physically present to help. And now that's not really all to help just with the robot it's also to help with managing crowd the crowd management. to robot yeah. interactions and everything so it's not i'm not saying that every optimus robot right now takes you know five tesla employees to operate um but in the situation that we saw yesterday we definitely know there's at least one teleoperator per any of those ones that were doing lots of those those cool like next level interactions there were, there were definitely optimus robots doing 100 percent fully autonomous stuff that was awesome too um but the like most impressive interactions with people were more than likely you know handled by teleoperation and so you have that teleoperator and then in a lot of the cases you also have a employee or two potentially you also had an engineer that's kind of there with the teleoperator helping gather data from the Optimus robot and make sure that, you know, if something, if they're seeing anything that's of concern from the sensor suite on board that, okay, that Optimus gets escorted, you know, back behind curtains and, and taken out from in front of everybody. But there's probably, you know, a little bit of support staff that's going on there. Um, but what an incredibly complex set of interactions and an environment to put Optimus in. And to your point, like, I think that their willingness to put that many robots in that close of proximity to that many people doing that many different things, like yeah. the complexity of the Optimus demonstration yesterday was next level. And I think most people are just going to think, oh, there was teleoperation there. And they're, they're just going to use that as an excuse 
to dismiss the whole thing and not appreciate the refinement of the Optimus platform from a physical, like the, the robotic standpoint purely, for it to be able to do all that stuff and none of them to just like completely break down and, you know, have a, a little robot seizure in yeah. front of everybody caught on cell phone and blasted to the world. Oh, Tesla's a complete failure. Um, that's a huge success. They were operating for, you know, several hours in front of people as well. Like that yeah. is super impressive. All of the, the fact that they're able to do lots of things autonomously, super impressive. Yeah. Like there are just so many, when you understand how hard it is to solve the, the Optimus challenge and you start thinking through, wow, there's a lot of those things that they ticked off and that they showed yesterday and it's incredible progress. And, you know, like we haven't seen a demonstration like that from literally any other humanoid robotics company. Unitree has showed some cool stuff. Figure has showed some cool stuff. Like there's a lot of cool demonstrations. There is not a single humanoid robotic demonstration that is on par with what we saw last night from Tesla. And I think that in and of itself is like a definitive throwing the gauntlet down moment that we are 100% far and away the leaders in humanoid robotics. For sure. 100%. Dude, like they literally already replaced bartenders for their events. You, you really think Tesla is going to have a bartender moving forward, like a human bartender now for their parties? Hell no. They're going to they're gonna start using the human or robots, and those human or robots are going to be the ones serving drinks. And they're going to collect the data from those events because that is very useful information. Like, Tesla almost has an incentive to host more parties. Like, Tesla has an incentive now to, like, bring people into, like, something they host and whatever tasks are done by the human or robot, you know. Well, most of, of that incentive is marketing, like you know, operating the the Optimus bartender Corner probably case. costs them more than having a you know hiring a human bartender. But data the the amount of attention and yeah, the data gathering that you get is next level. Yeah, it it pays for itself in in like a second. Like I would argue that, like. If someone from Tesla is listening, figure out a way to host an event once a month that the ro that the Tesla robot will be able to do those tasks and use those as get data get gathering things. Even if it's like send a bot to every Tesla store and just have them help you around, greet people at the door, like bring them swag. Dude, that is an awesome use case right there. Yeah. Like, why not? Like, I, I, dude, that's what's going to happen. That, that's, this is what I'm talking about. Like, even if it's teleoperated, bro, like, just have the person sit in Texas or Palo Alto, and then when the bot gets into trouble, beam into it. We already have high-speed internet everywhere. The ping's going to be, like, 50 milliseconds at max. It's like you playing Call of Duty or Overwatch and trying to cap some heads, bro. Like, just have people nearby so that the ping isn't that high. It's like literally playing a video game. Hey, uh, Tesla from, you know, bot from, uh, you know, Springfield uh, Service Center is having an, an issue. Okay, what's the issue? I don't know how to open this door. Okay, open the door. And then just do that constantly and have those, those bots just bring parts in the shop. Like I said, greet people at the door. There's so many use cases they can use right now with this bot that are, that are not just like data gathering tools, but it actually brings a tangible improvement to the business. You know, and you can do that now. Yeah, the question is, what's the headcount that you have to add to teleoperate? And, you know, if it's if it's one human per bot, then I don't think Elon's going to want to spend the money to do that at a Disagree. mass scale out level. If it's um, if it's less than that, then perhaps. I mean, I we think did... one human. Yeah, one human per bot works because you start at one human per bot with, say, 100 bots. And then you say, we're not, we're not ramping, we're not ramping the program until you're able to do two bots per human and then three bots per human. Right. So you, you, you allow the groundwork to begin. And then you, and then the use case is we cap the hiring at a hundred. And then from that point forward, if you want to manufacture more bots, you better make it work with a hundred people. You know, there's, it's just, this isn't like, I, I can see why this is missed. 
from the event because it's like because it is esoteric and it's insane it it's dumb and like it makes no sense that if a future of human or robots is already technically possible you know and it shouldn't be a surprise that the company that it, that their expertise is having set of the art manufacturing systems has figured out how to make the supply chain and the manufacturer system, manufacturing system work for a human or robot which has a lot of parts that are interchangeable with a car if you really think about it as elon musk explained previously you just have to it's the puzzle you just got to puzzle them so that you put them in a human or form factor and then their job is like okay how do we ramp this sucker up oh we need a new hand okay just replace the freaking forearm with a new with a new hand have the power electronics be able to support that new new thing or whatever oh we, we need to replace the arms okay replace the arms Oh, we need a new uh, bot. Okay, make a new bot. It's like, it's like, okay, it's there. Like, they can do it. I think we're thinking similarly. I don't think Elon's going to want to hire, you know, thousands and thousands of teleoperators. He's not going to want to ramp up the production of them while the ratio of, you know, operators to bots is one. But he will certainly start a, a group when it is at that level and max it out and, you know, cap it push the system yeah like push the limits do all the experimentation and then once they solve those problems and challenges move on to the next iteration and scale up the the system 